Thanks, John. I have never been, if I can make this, ah, thanks. I, I've never been introduced as a, is there a way to make that light? Oh, I guess it has to be because of the, um, because of the video, yeah. I've never been introduced just to give an introduction before. I don't think it's a trend in formalization in our society. But uh, this is a picture of John on the far right um, in a long time ago. And fortunately for us, he decided to not live his life as a pack mule and become a scientist. And that was good for us because his research over the next 50 years really helped guide our understanding of microbial ecology and change the way that we do science. I'm not going to show too many pictures, John, I promise, but uh, I couldn't resist, as you know, to putting some up here. Um, John really made two great breakthroughs in studying of microbes. The first had to do with the activity, and the second had to do with the numbers of bacteria in natural systems. And if you think about it, those are the two most central aspects to studying any kind of ecology. Along with Dick Wright, when they were postdocs at Uppsala, John used radioisotopes to study the natural rates of activity um, in lakes and oceans. And this was the first time that that had ever been done. Now the problem was still that even though we knew now what the rates of activity were, not in a laboratory but uh, in the field, we didn't know how many organisms were there. And John solved that problem as well, his second seminal breakthrough, with Jasper and Daly in developing a technique to use nuclear, nucleopore filters um, to count bacteria using epifluorescence microscopy. So it was very heady times then, and along with ideas of others on the microbial food web and food loop, those ideas that John helped develop really stimulated the field of microbial ecology for the next several decades. John's contributions to our society and to the scientific community have been equally stellar. He served as past president, or he was a past president of our society, ASLO, as well as the Association of Ecosystem Research Centers. Um, he served on the Ocean Studies Board and the Polar Research, Research Board of the National Academy of Sciences. And he was appointed by the president uh, to be on the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, which John told me today that he wasn't going to talk about his work in the Arctic, so I thought I would put this slide up. We we're supposed to be dripping rhodamine in very slowly uh, to the stream. John got a little impatient, just dumped the whole thing in. Um, so, the, the, although John, John has been at the Marine Biological Lab almost his whole career and hasn't had great access um, to students, but he has had a tremendous influence on people in, in part because he is a tremendously clear thinker. And he also has a great intellectual competitiveness. And I want to tell just one story that highlights both John's love of a competitive intellectual challenge and also his, his personal understatement. Uh, it was an at, at an ASLO meeting, and I was during a break. I was sitting with John outside on a bench with another colleague, and a younger and quite aggressive scientist came strolling up, and along with his gaggle of students from his lab, uh, confronted John by loudly announcing that my newest paper will blow your citation classic out of the water nonchalantly and always the gentleman, John paused for a second and simply said, which one? <laughs> a very good question that I don't think any of us would have thought about. Um, even though John shies away from publicity, he's run, won great awards. Um, he won the Hutchinson Award from our society, the second one ever given. And it was 25 years ago uh, at this meeting here in St. John's. John told me just this morning that during that meeting in June, there was a big iceberg stranded off just outside the bay. So m maybe things have changed a little bit. Um, he has recently been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's won the Odom Award from the Estuarine Research Federation. And uh, just last year, he was named as Distinguished Scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory, which is a very rare uh, thing because there's only been one other person in that institution's 120-year history to have won that award. 
So I think that John is very deserving of this Redfield Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him among our ranks, and I consider myself uh, to have had a charmed career just because I've been able to work with him so closely. So now Sybil Seichinger, our president, will actually give the award to John. Oh yeah, I've got another, I've got another slide. Yeah, and I can blank it. You don't like this one either. <laughs> All right. Well, John, I'm very honored to uh, present this um, plaque to you um, for the Lifetime Achievement Award um, in recognition of the contributions in the field of aquatic microbial ecology uh, and truly exceptional involvement with the development of important institutions and research programs. And in addition, um, ASLO has started a new um, series in terms of our ASLO named awards and we're um, now having biographies of the individuals who the award was named after. And you may have noticed that in the December 07 um, issue of the ASLO Bulletin, we had our first um, biography, and that was for the Alfred Redfield, um, of Alfred Redfield. And um, so the first um, copy of this now is going to be given to John, as well as our previous recipients of this award and future as well. So congratulations, John. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Sybil and John and, and the whole society for this great honor. Um, honors, from, honors from colleagues, as you know, are absolutely the best kind to get, although they seldom pay very much. You know, it's, 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 it, it is a great honor. And um, what I would like to do today is tell you about three interesting stories rather than give a whole history. As George said, I've had to leave out uh, 40 years of research in the Arctic. Um, which one do I hit? Hmm? Down arrow. You told me just the B. There we go. Okay, um, microorganisms in situ. So this is not a laboratory talk. And when I was growing up, that's about all we had was laboratory research on microbes. And yet, we don't even think about that much in the ecological side now because we've got a bunch of wonderful Techniques and these are always fun to, because we always get a big jump in in, in knowledge when we d discover something, a new way of looking at microbes. So um, Tom Brock was one of the first people who was really pushing this, and uh, he 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 said, "Well, chemostats, all the rest are not." are not the answer, and yet this is what all the microbiologists, classically trained microbiologists, love to do. And um, we have to get to study organisms in nature. Well, he goes on um, attacking his, his, his fellow micro, microbiologist and talks about, um, about um, that, that most people don't like to work. And his idea of work was really uh, uh, looking at the activities, with the, uh, with the auto radiographs, um, he really liked big bacteria, about 10 or 15 microns in size. So he worked on organisms in, in uh, Yellowstone re region. And, um, and so he actually, uh, uh, talking to him one, one day and, and said, well, you know, I published a paper uh, using, using the, the epi microscope. So that was the first idea that I had that this was what, what, we, what we might look at. And of course, that was one of the keys to being able to count the bacteria in, in the plankton. Um, I also want to mention my major professor, David Fry, who was the first editor of 
L and O back in the back in the early 50s, and uh, Dave was a student with uh, Jude back at Wisconsin, and he he actually worked with zooplankton a lot. And when I took his course, um, we used a book back in 1959 that actually had no no uh, mention of bacteria at all. And uh, because people had no way of, of, of tying it in to the other processes of what was happening in lakes. Um, and Dave and, and Fred Fry had actually translated the book from, from the German. So that was where a lot of our uh, knowledge and our books were coming from. But then, 1959, um, a book came out in from East Germany where they had translated a big, a seminal book from the, from the Russian, and this was the first inkling we had of all the work that went on, and this was a Kuznetsov's book. And so I'll, I'll show you a couple of figures from that, but we actually, in the class, we tried all these methods, direct count, respiration, none of them worked, but um, at least we were aware that bacteria we're, we're out there, and if you look at the data, look at the top left there, bacteria in, uh, in a lake study in 1937. Well, the units look pretty good, 10 to the 6 per ml. Uh, the, the, these were direct counts on some of the first membrane filters, and uh, the, these were guarded secrets of, of, of uh, how they did that. Uh, lake, lake Baikal, uh, order of magnitude less, that's probably, that, that's probably the right right. Uh, they could be off by 20% or 30%. Um, and then here's a typical Russian uh, picture of a reservoir, and the uh, number four is actually the only rate measurement of chemosynthesis in there. It can be done with carbon-14. So that was the only uh, measurement. They tend to pile all these things one on top of another. But these are from the, some of the first studies that we had with had, had some actual rates and numbers in. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the epifluorescence microscopy. I actually started looking at this when I was a postdoc in Uppsala back in the, back in the early, early 60s just with transmitted light. Now if you look up at that, um, well, the, the Struger's work back, back with Acridine orange gave us an idea that you could label, label the DNA. And then Rodina published some work in Russian. Monroe and Brock was the first time people were using the reflected light for uh, fluorescence microscopy. And the, where the arrow is, it, sh it shows a picture of, um, of an algal culture Don Francisco, and those two little dots to the uh, left of the nucleus of, of, that, of that cell are the bacteria that they actually published in 1973. Uh, I told Don about the epifluorescence, and so um, I take some credit for, for putting him on that track. So I bought an epi microscope for $16,000 in 1970. That's the same cost of the same microscope today, only the microscope's 10 times better. And if $16,000 translated, it's almost $90,000 today. So that's one field where, where um, because the medical people got, came into this field, then the price dropped, and the quality has actually gone up. Uh, early paper, uh, Daily and Hobby, 1975 in L&O, we used um, millipore filters, but we soon became aware that 50% of the bacteria were being caught inside the millipore filters. And the, the major breakthrough was nuclepore filters. George learned how to pronounce that. Um, and as a nuclear physicist, Beaufort Price, and that's him in the bathing suit in the Antarctic. And that's on his, where, on his website. He's a famous physicist from Berkeley, and he, they had a firm, a con company for some reason, and he actually made $100, he told me, uh, 
inventing the nuclear pore filters, which of course gives us um, very clear and accurate filtration. You know what the size is there. Problem with nuclear pore filters was that in fact they were white and you added acridine orange or other dyes and the filters picked it up and you couldn't see the bacteria. So Ralph Daly, who was a postdoc with me at that time, worked very hard to find a dye. He was working with the, with the, with the company, talking to them, and he found Ergolin Black. So we were all busy um, dyeing all these filters by hand, hanging up the dry and everything. And finally, after a number of years, uh, the company actually came out with, with black filters. So it's much easier now. It's so, so easy that, in fact, um, no one actually references this important work. <laughs> Everybody assumes, well, we always have known how to, how to do that. Well, we didn't. It took a long time to, uh, to figure it out. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Ralph, because he's a famous Canadian scientist and um, worked up in, in the Arctic with us on the IBP studies in early, early 1900. And he became the head of the National Water Research Institute here in Canada for 10 years. And then he went to become the founding director of the um, United Nations University International um, Network on Water, Environment, and Health, and did that for another, um, another, t another 10 years. So he was a very, very famous uh, uh, scientist in, in Canada. And that's a pic picture from just a couple years ago. Um, so here's a nice picture from, uh, from, from Ed and Steve. It's a SEM picture. But gee, there are a lot of different kinds of bacteria there, aren't there? And they've added the colors. Um, so how many of these are active? Because bacteria can turn, go inactive. They don't have to be. Presence doesn't mean activity, which we can't say that for algae and zooplankton and all the rest. You see a bacteria, you don't know much more except how many that, that there are. And of course, what are these bacteria? Well, at, at, the, at the MBL, uh, now there's a group trying to, making progress on uh, putting probes with different colors of fluorescence uh, on, on them um, into these bacteria. And they actually use single-stranded RNA probes, and they can put several different colors of, of, uh, of uh, fluorescence on there. And, they, and um, so that they can figure out right now 45 different bacteria just by, just by looking at them. And the best thing that they invented was a great name. You got to have that classy fish. Now, aren't you sorry you didn't think about that before? So this is the to image microbial diversity. And so just to show you how it works, they've taken uh, coliform bacteria, a, a culture, and divided it up into 28 different, um, different subcultures. And then they've labeled each one with, one, with uh, two different colors, actually. And the colors interact. Um, and so they can identify, and we see over on the over on the right-hand side, uh, this is a hemocytometer count versus a count from a photo like this. And um, you can see that they can count all these different 28 different, different, different forms. They can now do 45 different. So I keep telling them, well, but these are act bacteria with all this RNA, but then out in nature, bacteria don't have much. I, I don't know how many how much RNA they might have and still be active at all. But the point is that you can't, that I've spent years of my life testing methods that just didn't work because bacteria in the culture are not the same as bacteria out in the natural system. So, um, so the, the, their goal is to, in fact, get this to, to work on Eel Pond there in uh, Woods Hole, which is a little bit richer. But, um, but I, so this was the, uh, 
the, the name, the project, Gary Borisi, who's our head uh, of the laboratory, Rudolf Oldenburg is, is a physicist, a light physicist, and the two graduate students working on that, Brown graduate students, Alec Baum and Yoko Hasegawa. So, um, and other people have, 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 have been working on this. So that was 28 different subcultures. Now here is uh, Jessica Mark Welch actually grew up these 10 different cultures and was uh, able to, to uh, label different ones and do these counts again, how many did they add and then how many were they able to, to uh, note on, the, on this micrograph. So these are 10 different taxa and actually some are um, labeled on the 16S and some labeled on the 28S. And the, the, um, so, so they've tested this in the laboratory. And when I say yes, but you, natural bacteria don't have that many, that much RNA, then they say, well, we can measure the light from a single molecule of, of, of dye, of fluorescent dye. So, so there is hope yet, um, but and it's still early times. Uh, and they've again done 45 combinations of probe and color. So that is where this method might go in the future. But of course, they've got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of of light measuring uh, systems. So, um, but you know, things things do change, just like that. Epi Epi microscope has gotten cheaper. So we'll see what happens out of all this. But potentially, one, if you know what bacteria are, are there, you could count them over, over time as they move up and down in the sediment. You could do all sorts of things as, as you go down a chain of lakes and streams. You could count and see what happens to, to all these different species. So it's a, it, interesting. So that's classy fish. The uptake kinetics actually came first. And this grew out, uh, really, of Steeman Nielsen's paper in 1952. Here's a nice picture I took of Steeman Nielsen over in Italy. And he measured photosynthesis. And it was our first, really, in situ measurement of, of, of any of these rates. Uh, and after the initial arguments with Ryther and all, all sorts of people, um, it's become a pretty standard measurement for an added C14 bicarbonate. Well, there's always lots of bicarbonate in just about every system, not all, every system. Uh, and so people never worried about, about the concentration that you're adding. And yet, if you're going to do a tracer study, you do not want to change the rate by what you're adding. And you don't want to bring in a whole new uh, process by what you're adding. Well, uh, when people then took that and started adding C14 glucose or acetate or amino acids, they never thought of that. That never, never entered their mind. In fact, we really didn't know what the concentrations were at that time. And so um, a nice paper, Goldman, Hobby, and Mason, uh, Charles Goldman wanted to be first author. Um, <laughs> why are we surprised? And. Uh, <laughs> So we were added 330 micromoles of glucose, which I think is, uh, I don't know, 120 times, 200,000 times more concentration than there is glucose in natural systems. So this part of this next theme I'm talking about is don't do that. <laughs> and uh, so I'll, I'll show you what happens here. So here's, uh, I was. Fantastically lucky, not only working with Ralph Daly, and, but Dick Wright and I were both postdocs at Uppsala. And I had an NIH postdoctoral grant. Can you imagine that today? And Dick had an NSF grant. And we were on our own. And um, we had a wonderful time. Uh, we started out looking at the heterotrophic activity of algae. And it soon became apparent when we started adding C14 glucose and things 
that in fact it was the bacteria, not the algae, that, that were doing it. Well, um, Dick Wright is on the right here, and the other two Yoho's here are um, David Kirchman and Hugh Ducklow, um, back in their salad days. And uh, so Dick was a, got his PhD at uh, Harvard, did some work with cultures at Wood, Woods Hole, and he really knew his biochemistry. So that was lucky because in 1962, Parsons and Strickland came up with a paper. And this was a whole new idea that one can use the pretty standard enzyme activity measurement of adding different amounts of substrate and looking at the rates to analyze the activity of microbes in natural systems. They were using perhaps a little too high concentrations here uh, for acetate and, and glucose, but boy, we thought this was great. We we're going to try it in fresh water, and we were convinced that everyone was going to be start publishing on this immediately, and we, we really buckled down and worked hard, and of course nobody did anything with this for three or four years except us, and so we got a real head start. It, it was an activity measurement. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Here is, a, a, again, a Michaelis mountain modification, and if you look at that um, part of the graph that says slope equal 1 over V, okay, that's a way of getting the V max of the, of the uptake, which, ha which uh, happens with, with en enzymes. Now, in, and that's the type of, of, of uh, result we got when we added glucose at lower and lower concentrations. We started off high and kept moving lower and lower and lower. And um, the extrapolation down to the ordinate, the y-axis here, is actually the turnover time. Is glucose being um, turned over in two hours, in 20 hours? So we actually had a measurement of the turnover of the, con of the con concentration that was there. We didn't know what the concentration was. We could measure the turnover. And we could measure the Vmax. This is the activity, um, which is a lot like leucine Vmax, which people look at, at what concentration the curve actually flattens up. So that's the same type of idea. Now, we had a culture here. We set up um, with bacteria and then with algae. Um, so we had a, a chlamydomonas. So that horizontal line. KD up at the top, that's the algal uptake. Okay, I'll come back to that. In and so we did Lake Erkin, published in 1966. Um, and these, these are the actual Vmax for glucose and acetate. Well, at this point, then we could begin to compare this with algal um, activity. When did the act algae peak? When does the productivity peak? and actually begin to get at the interaction of algae and bacteria. So this is the first um, really an annual cycle that anybody had, had done. Well, um, this, these are the turnover times, which we had to put on a log scale because that ranged by a couple of orders of, of ma magnitude from a, about three or four hours um, up to 1,000 hours during the, during the winter. And so we had the first activity me measurements, annual cycles, rela relation to algal productivity. It wasn't quite the measurement we wanted. It wasn't productivity. But uh, I'm not sure the productivity measurements today are much, are much different, except that now you multiply by a number of things to get up <coughs> to the actual carbon. And <coughs> we determined, very importantly, that one had to measure uptake kinetics at very low concentrations of substrate. In fact, Microbial uptake is responsible for the very low concentrations that we see, amino acids, acetate, all sorts of sugars. And the concentration is nanomoles. And in fresh waters, it's typically, I don't know, 10 to 20 nanomoles of, of, of substrate. That's a very low amount. Why is it so low? The bacteria take it up. Okay. And then eventually, this led to the concept that we can measure bacterial productivity through incorporation of thymidine or leucine. 
So that, uh, again, at very low concentrations, using the same, same ideas. I wish we thought, of, thought we, we could go further with it, but here it is. And so bacteria versus algae. Um, this is the same graph as I showed you previously, only this is uh, li linear here. And we see that the, that the uh, bacteria uh, mo move, the, their uptake saturates at very low concentrations. So that's what happens. Well, we're always trying to measure way over on the left-hand si side of, of the concentration figure there. Um, that's when the bacteria are much more active in uptake than the algae, and the algae are that continuously um, rising line slope uh, equals KD, a, a, a coefficient that's related to the concentration. So the more one adds of glucose, the higher the rate of uptake of the, of the algae. So uh, very soon, the algae are taking up more than the bacteria. So if you want to look at nature, you darn well better be down at that lower level because that's where the concentrations are and that's where the bacteria are out competing the algae. Well, Grover Stevens published a lot of papers in science and he added glucose, radioactive glucose to everything. And he said, he said uh, famously that the invertebrate eggs in seawater are actually living on DOC. And he could measure the concentration of C14 glucose getting into, into the eggs. And what I would say now is his concentrations of 6 to 200 micromoles of glucose, again, were three orders of magnitude too high. And he showed with this coral that, in fact, that, oh, these concentrations of 21 to 40 micromoles could actually feed the, the respiration of, of the corals. Well, concentration from Ken Mopper's work is down here, 50 nanomoles, nanomoles or less. So again, you have to be very careful of the concentration. And what happens is that every time there's a biological membrane and you put a, a, a um, solution of radioactive glucose or amino acids on one side, it gets through on the other side. Doesn't, you don't, you're not measuring any back reaction. You're just looking at how much gets in. And um, it, so, so you, sh you shouldn't publish papers <laughs> on that and talk about how, how um, algae are outcompeting bacteria. Well, um, again, the same argument here, you have to be very careful. Now here's a paper from Alan O, uh, uh, Dr. Fee, um, and here they are looking at um, seagrasses. They're looking at a, um, in, in the water of the leaf, and they are adding, well you see concentrations of amino acids here. Um, this are, these are micromoles. So uh, again, uh, at least two orders of magnitude too high. And their conclusion here in the quotes, the ability to take up DON enables seagrasses and macroalgae to shortcut end cycling, gives them access to additional end resources. Sci scientists working in soil say exactly the same thing. They add high concentrations and they say, gee, ability to take up DON enables tree roots to shortcut end cycling gives them access to additional end resources. For the same reason, we should require a whole range of concentrations. Don't just throw out any old concentration that you think might be, might be fine. What happens at the very low concentration? Who's really getting it? Um, so I would expect, I was very upset when Eleanor Al published this. That's all I can say. Uh, here's a nice picture. Um, a famous laboratory Tom Fenchel set up in Aarhus. And so uh, in the top we have uh, Tom Fenchel, Henry Blackburn, myself. Next row is Veldkamp, 
Uta Cohen, Tom Pappenberg, and Seaman Nielsen. You recognize him on the far right. And I was hoping to be able to point at these, but I won't. Um, and then next row is Bo Barker Jorgensen, John Sorensen, John, John Postcott over on the right. And then we have Bo Svensson, Marianne Clarhorn. Where's Dave Carl? Do we recognize Dave Carl? Well, he's fourth from the left there. If we put a motorcycle in there, you'd know who it was. So that's why Dave Carl knows anything. See, he took all these courses with, with all the rest of us. Finally, in the last uh, two or three minutes, um, are soil bacteria ecologically different from aquatic bacteria? What could be more fundamental question to ask now that we're interested in whole watersheds, we're interested in land water interaction? We don't know the answer to this question. Um, that's why it's talking about there are big gaps in our, in our, in our knowledge. I'm going to show you a couple of graphs here um, about what happens with, with soil. The respiratory response is very similar, certainly. Well, here's a soil respiration. Nice thing about soil, it's easy to measure respiration. And so here they've subtracted out 200 and, 209 uh, a rate here, so th this is everything above 209, and they added amino acids here, right in the middle, and this is uh, minutes. So what happens is they add amino acids here, and they added ra radioactive amino acids, and they're adding 50 millimoles. Well, any bacteria worth his salt, you give him one micromole and he's going to go to town. You get a cloudy solution in 10 micromoles. Here they're adding 50 millimoles. So we're talking about orders of magnitude, once again, different. And the respiration begins very fast. Now this is, is um, as micromoles of CO2, OK? And glucose up at the top is what they've added. So there's a very strong respiration response here they've added water, they've added glycine, and they've added um, glucose. So there's a strong response. Uh, and here, um, it's very interesting to me that, in fact, when we looked at how much respiration happened when we added these, these low concentrations to the, to the bacteria back in a, in a freshwater pond, an estuary, a paper in um, Eleanor in 1969, great unrecognized, unquoted paper. Here, a uh, freshwater pond on the, on the left column there. And we see these are percents, how much in, in just an hour or so, of the radioactive glutamic acid, for example, turned into C14CO2. Well, here it's 61%. Uh, aspartic acid, high there. Glycine, 28%. In an estuary, it was 30, um, 38%. Leucine, isoleucine, lysine, they're down there. Um, so why are these bacteria <laughs> respiring this stuff? It's so rare in nature. They respire it. Um, they don't put it into making protein. It's always b bothered me. So they aren't, they aren't thinking. <laughs> and. It doesn't make any sense that they then take this energy and build up a protein again with uh, different amino acids. So that's the information that we had. And we said, well, the reason you have different percents there, you can set up a nice biochemical pathway where um, uh, lysine has to be changed and a leucine and isoleucine. And then finally it gets up to glutamic acid. The, uh, the uh, amino group is knocked off. And the carbon skeleton goes into the, into the um, energy cycle. That's what they're doing. So bacteria in nature, obviously, carbon energy limited, right? Because they can always go back, and then they have to go back and build up their whole. Well, when people started doing soil research, look it, it's the same results. And we see agriculture versus soil, 45% for glutamic acid, 28% for glycine, 20% for glycine. It's the same percentage. So they're doing the same thing. 
in the soil bacteria versus the, um, as, in, as in the water system. Why is that? Well, again, they came up two years ago with a brilliant idea that, well, it's a place in this ladder of, of change here. Um, and, and then this is, I think, the last slide here. Well, they, they were smarter than that. This is J.B. Jones and people in Wales. Um, so they added different concentrations. Look at that. Tenth of a micromole looks exactly like, uh, practically much like 10 millimole in terms of percent C14, CO2 produced. Okay? And what happens is they, they add it, and it's immediately all taken up. Immediately. There's nothing left. It's all taken up, and the bacteria start to respire. So what I interpret this, and I've written a paper now, we'll see how happy they are with that, is any time an amino acid molecule becomes free because of decomposition, it immediately gets taken up. That's the only way I can figure out that. Because in the same soil, they're saying, gee, there's three micromoles of lysine, glycine present all, all year round. So it doesn't make any sense unless they can't measure the glycine because it's really protected in terms of a bio availability by clays or something else. But, um, and so that's what's happening in the soil. So, um, so my conclusion, microbial processes are very similar, but massive numbers of soil bacteria dictate re that um, research in this way cannot measure bacterial production with leucine because uh, there just is very low concentrations, which I can't, can't prove yet, but looking at the isotope data, the time course data, I'm, I'm saying this is probably what's happening. And I think the soil people are overestimating the concentrations by two or three orders of, orders of magnitude. So, um, so that's all, all I have. I hope you've learned a little bit about uh, bacteria and isotopes and or, organic matter. Thank you very much. As ever, could it defend? Going to, going to, going to. Well, I wasn't going to bring it up, but I think that um, there are a lot of unexplained questions there, too. And uh, when people look for the saturation when they're doing sed sediment work and, and with leucine, which is what they should be doing, they come up with a number for the plateau of 50 uh, micromoles. I don't think that the, the net result is very bad. I think maybe. A lot of these bacteria on sediment are attached. They've got, they've got um, um, so some protective um, or mucopolysaccharides or something over. And I think when you add these radio radioactive compounds, they have trouble getting in. So it's a, you keep adding more and more and more. And, um, but because the end result is quite a low number still, because you don't multiply this 50 uh, micromoles by anything that has to do with the Results, so so that's uh, so that's what I think now, and I think we should have some more more detailed studies. And there are a number of people looking at the availability of these organic compounds in um, in sediments too. Larry Larry Meyer up at uh, Maine, University of Maine, for one. So, so you're asking the question, you're adding such low 
concentrations. Well, pe people, uh, Jed Furman is, uh, has gone down lower than I'm talking about here. I'm talking about 10 nan nanomoles. He was down at one nano nanomoles in the ocean, and he still got pretty good results. So that didn't seem to be a any limiting question factor. We better cut off questioning there and move move ahead. Uh, could you thank John once more? Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good. Uh, uh, just a you, want, you want this? Or?